It's no secret that Florida has some of the best bird photography opportunities in North America. This subtropical climate is considered to be one of the most complicated and biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. Join me as I photograph a variety of wildlife here at the Rich Grissom Memorial Wetlands, AKA Vieira Wetlands. I'm Doug Gardner and your wild photo venture starts now. We've got a beautiful foggy morning and the light's starting to, to lift a little bit. The fog's breaking up and, and the light levels are coming up. But right now we still have very low light. We've got some beautiful sandhill cranes right out here in front of us. The sandhill crane is considered one of the large cranes. And while Florida has a small population of sandhill cranes, the largest um, numbers of, of the sandhill crane population migrate through the Nebraska North Platte River Basin area with as much as 450,000 coming through that area. It's really a, a treat to see these birds. They're magnificent birds. They have the, a very distinct call and they're strikingly beautiful. You got that red crest, yellow eyes, and then that slate blue um, body and really uh, makes for a beautiful image out here in these grasslands. These birds are very large. They stand almost four feet tall. I love hearing them, uh, the pair call back and forth to each other. This particular pair of cranes uh, looks like they're exhibiting some nesting behavior. Both of them are picking up sticks and putting them in a pile right now. So this is a, this is a nice find. Now, the fog is actually really helping kind of soften up the image a little bit. Uh, I like the mood. I really like the mood that this has given me. Now, this is another perfect example where if you have a neutral tone subject and a neutral tone background, which everything in this scene is neutral tone, you can pretty much trust what your camera's meter is going to tell you. Because remember, the camera's meter wants to make everything neutral gray. And that bird, his feathers are neutral gray. The grass, if you turn that grass, green grass, into uh, black and white, it would appear neutral gray. So uh, this is a perfect scenario. You can pretty much trust exactly what your camera's gonna tell you is the correct exposure. Now, this is also a great example of where automatic cameras will do a really good job giving you a great photograph. Um, you know, it's the situations where you have contrasty light and bright, bright whites and, and real dark black areas this is where your automatic cameras are gonna have a little trouble, but this is the ideal scenario for that. Now that the sun's popping out a little bit, this changes everything completely. I've got to readjust my exposure. Now I told you that you only want to use the, the highest ISO you have to. Well, now that the sun's popped out, I can start lowering that ISO rating. And what I'll always, when I'm trying to, to monitor my exposures, I will drop the ISO first, keep dropping it until I get to one or 200 ISO. Then, if I still have to, to darken my image down because the sun's getting too bright, I'll start adjusting shutter speed and, and aperture at that point. But I always lower ISO first and then start adjusting shutter speed and aperture. All right, these guys are, it looks like they're starting to work their way back into some thicker grass. I'm not gonna be able to do anything with it, but you know what, there's tons to see here, so let's get going and see what else we can find. This is the reason you have to be really careful along the water's edge here at Vieira Wetlands. You got alligators everywhere and, uh, and you have snakes around here. So be very careful when you come down to the water's edge. Now this little guy right here, he's not gonna do much harm to you, but there are much larger alligators uh, in these wetlands. So be very careful. Well, over the past few shows, we have a lot of opportunities talk about getting exposure for white subjects and neutral tone subjects, but we haven't had really had a lot of opportunity for dark or black subjects, things that are darker than neutral gray. Well, this is a perfect opportunity. This is an American coot. There's actually quite a few of them right here along the edge of this berm. And we've got bright overcast lighting. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty close, probably closer to full sun than it is overcast. 
and which is actually a great light to shoot in because it's not quite as harsh. And so all I'm doing to get an exposure of this is I'm metering something neutral tone, which in this situation will either be the northern blue sky or the green vegetation in the background. So I get a meter reading for that, and then I open up a stop to a stop in the third. That'll give me the perfect exposure for that black coop. Another way you can do it is if that coop moves in really close to us where he fills, his body fills most of my meter area, all I've got to do is meter the black and stop down one to one and a third stops. All right, we got two more little coots coming by here. These guys are really hard to keep in focus because a lot of times they're in and out of vegetation, so uh, autofocus doesn't work real well in this scenario. So I, I'm manually focusing this. And they, they move so doggone fast, it's really hard to, to keep that manual focus tack sharp. But you just got to wait for those moments when they stop and hesitate and look at you. That's when you can get, achieve sharp focus and fire your shots. When you're working with these birds along the edge of these wetlands, slow and steady is the best way to approach them. No sudden movements. I mean, you're not going to hide from these birds. I mean, that's, that's not what you're trying to do here. I mean, they see so many visitors in a year's time that, you know, trying to hide from them is not the best way to go. Just, you don't want to make startling movements or be real loud. That's the main thing. Well, this is pretty good. I'll have about a 45 degree angle to the light here. And you want to watch their body behavior. You don't want to do anything to really disturb them. You know, I've got this running joke with my buddies. You know, where I live, we have so many white birds and we always walk around and say, oh, that's just another white bird. But sometimes, You've run across opportunities where that white bird is just an incredibly beautiful situation. And that's what we got right here. We got uh, a white ibis and um, he is feeding around in this green aquatic vegetation. And it's, it's a really per pretty scenario because I got reflections, I got blue water, I've got the lush green of the vegetation. So this is a, a, actually a really nice shot. Now a lot of people would look at this scenario also and say, well, there's there's vegetation between the camera and the bird. Well, I kind of like that. It shows the environment in, in which they live in. I like seeing him feed in and out of the grass and maybe have a little bit of grass, you know, blocking him. Um, like you're looking through the grass at him, kind of in, you're another bird in his environment. This is going to be a hard situation to try to use autofocus in because there's, I'm shooting through so much vegetation that the autofocus sensor is, want, is going to want to jump on this blades of grass. So manual focus is the way to go right here. And there he goes. He's flying off. Well, that was a great opportunity. Let's keep going. There's so much to see here at Vieira Wetlands. All right, another great find here at Vieira Wetlands. We've got a limpkin standing out here in front of us. I'm simply metering the grass again and just recomposing my shot and my exposures are coming out dead on the money. And right now, we got full sun. I'm shooting 1 1250 of a second at 6.3 aperture and my ISO is 200 right now. So I'm covered on all bases. Like my aperture is, a, is allowing me to have a very shallow depth of field so he pops out of all this grass that he's standing in and um, I've got enough shutter speed to stop the action. This guy is, uh, is obviously not worried about my presence one bit. What he's doing, he's, he's looking for snails, and he'll find the snail and he'll bring it to the bank. And I saw some of these guys earlier here there. Um, these are snails, and that's what he's fishing for. Pretty good sized snails. And so he's making a pretty good meal out of this. He's, he's got two or three of them already, and it's really amazing to watch them because he'll take that bill, he'll jam down into that snail and, and pull the actual animal out of there. It's pretty amazing to watch their unique feeding behaviors. I believe I just saw some teal drop down in that next cell over there. Let's go check that out. That'd be an, a nice variety to this trip. Uh, you know, I love my waterfowl, so let's go check that out. Blue winged teal, an absolutely beautiful duck. Uh, they're one of the smaller species of ducks. 
blue winged teal gets its name from the iridescent baby blue wing patches on the backs of the wings. Now you can't see those patches until they either do a wing flap or in flight when they bank away from you. You can see the wing patches in uh, very, very beautiful coloration. They're called dabbling ducks. They'll actually just dabble with their bills on the, on the surface of the water, picking up little invertebrate. Now they will tip up and, and stick their head down and reach as far as they can uh, with, their, with their neck to, to get vegetation and other invertebrates under the water. So generally you're going to find them in shallow areas. I prefer action shots over the portraits any day, but I still, I still shoot my portraits because that's what we have offered here in front of us right now. Um, I haven't seen a lot of flying activity with the ducks. I'm mostly just sitting. So that tells me that not only are they roosting in here, but they, they do all their feeding and loafing in these ponds as well. So they're not moving around a whole lot. Also out in front of us, we got some ring necks. Uh, originally called the ring bill because of the white stripe on the bill. But if you're close enough that you can see very distinct details, you'll find that there's a burgundy ring around his neck. And you really have to be in full sun and pretty close to him to see that burgundy ring. But uh, that's where they get the name ring neck. This is a perfect example of the other feeding habit. These are divers. Ringnecks are considered diving ducks, which means they dive completely under the water to get their food. Now, ringnecks, they generally gather in large groups. Now, this group right here, I don't know, 35 to 50 animals in this particular group. When they all start feeding, it's kind of a feeding frenzy. And you, they bunch up real tight, and it's really hard to get a good photograph uh, when they're that tight together. So the best thing to do is just wait it out, let the feeding frenzy end, and then the birds will start preening and spreading out, and you'll be able to isolate one or two or even three birds uh, by themselves. If you try to photograph them while they're in a big group, you're gonna have nothing but black blobs all clumped together. So wait for those birds to finish feeding and spread out. Some of them will start to go to sleep, some of them will start preening, and then you can isolate the birds. That's the best way to do this. One of the shots you want to look for is when the ducks sit up on the water and give you that nice wing flap. Those can be some super dramatic shots. And it's really, an, it's not a very hard shot to get. All you've got to do is watch the birds. When they start feeding, as soon as they get done feeding, they'll generally tip the head down, get a little drink of water, and then sit up. They'll, they'll raise the head up and then they'll do a wing flap. Almost always they'll do that. And then they'll start preening. And usually after they finish preening, they'll sit up and do another wing flap. So it's just watching the subject, understanding your subject, and waiting it out. And you'll get those magnificent shots. After they, usually after they finish preening, they'll go to sleep and just, just sit out there and, and sleep for a while. Those can be some pretty cute shots, especially if you're photographing ruddy ducks. Ruddy ducks are kind of cool because they'll tuck their bill in under their wing and they'll take one foot and they'll kind of swim around in circles while they're asleep. It's kind of cute to watch. It's hard to photograph that, of course, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not always about the photograph. It's just enjoying nature, enjoying you know, the experience of being outdoors. You always hear me talking about changing your angle of view to improve composition or can improve lighting. This is a perfect example to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Now, if you imagine if I stood here on the road with my camera pointed out, the distance between the camera level here and where my camera is now is almost 10 feet. It really helps make it a more intimate shot if you get down on your subject's level. So, Whenever possible, get down as low as you possibly can. The results will be absolutely amazing. All right, yet another great scenario. We've got this pond full of white pelicans. Really nice opportunities. I mean, these are beautiful birds anyway. They got that, that beautiful yellow bill and then obviously the, the white bodies. So as I look through the camera here, trying to come up with a composition, actually I have several opportunities for different photographs. I've got one single bird by himself. I'm kind of isolating him, and I just have an ocean of blue around him with nice green background. Yeah, very nice. Now, you also can use multiple birds to create a composition. You know, groups of three or two birds 
uh, interacting together or, or patterns, the way the birds are actually sitting in the frame to form a pattern. Look for those, those interesting elements to uh, improve your compositions. By simply metering the neutral tone green grass on the opposite bank and then closing down or taking away a stop in one third of light, uh, now I have an exposure of one sixteen hundredth of a second shutter speed at 7.1 f-stop and my ISO is 160. By exposing for the white, the, I'm, I'm actually kind of underexposing the blue and the green and it's just really saturating those colors. Great situation here. We've been noticing a lot of birds flying in this evening and that's what you want to look for is great action shots. You know, the, the portraits of birds sitting on the water, I mean, that's nice. I mean, you know, we all want those shots too and they make great photographs. But for me personally, I like looking for those action shots, the birds in flight, and this looks like a perfect setup to do this. We've got the light coming in over our shoulder here and the wind is coming over our shoulder. So large birds are always gonna take off and land into the wind. So that means these birds are gonna come and land straight into our face here, which is a great opportunity. I hope we get some good flight shots out of this scenario. When you're photographing birds in flight and you're using autofocus, one thing that you can do to speed up the rate in which your lens acquires sharp focus in autofocus mode is by adjusting your autofocus limit switch on the side of the lens. Now what this does, it has three selections. 4.5 meters to infinity, which means that the lens will autofocus on subjects between 4.5 meters away from the lens to infinity. So the lens is going to run, it's going to search that full range of distance to try to acquire sharp focus. Then you have the second selection, which is 4.5 to 10 meters. So if you know that your subject is going to stay between 4.5 meters away from the camera and 10 meters away from the camera, if it stays in that range, then the camera only has to search that distance and it really helps speed up the amount of time for the camera to acquire sharp focus. And then you have a third selection, which is 10 meters to infinity. So if my subject is 10 meters out in front of me and beyond, you want to select that mode. That way the lens is only searching that distance. The less the lens has to search, the faster it's going to acquire focus and the greater your opportunity of actually capturing a, a sharp image of a bird in flight. So most of the time, especially with ducks and things like that, as the birds are passing by, they're going to be farther than 10 meters away from me. So I always select 10 meters to infinity and that's a good range to stay in. All right, another great opportunity. We've got a little blue heron that's just flown in and he's sitting on this cluster of three palm trees here. Really cool shot. Um, I had to work a little bit with the background here because the first place that he landed, all I had was a plain blue background, which is not very appealing, and the stump that he's sitting on uh, didn't have much character to it at all. So I waited a little bit and I moved over just a few feet and now he's on the middle palm and that palm has got much more character to it. You can see the the uh, fronds, come, old fronds coming off the side of it, and he's actually sitting on the right hand side of that right now. So that's much more appealing. Remember, if your background doesn't add to your photograph, it's taking away from your photograph. So if you don't believe there's a wide variety of birds here at Vera Wetlands, here's a perfect example. I've got a great egret, I've got a white ibis, I've got a glossy ibis, I've got a black duck, all in the same shot. One of the things that everybody comes to Vera Wetlands for is to get the great blue herons nesting on top of the palm trees. Now, most of the day, the great blues aren't doing much of anything. And so you may have to camp out on the nest to, to get that great shot. And the shots that you really want to look for are the flight shots where the great blues are coming back into the nest and you know, they're bringing either nesting material or food back to the little chicks. 
So, you know, you wait for the wing spread shot right as they hover above the nest, right before they land. Uh, you want to look for shots where they're actually feeding the chicks. Uh, you can get a lot of behavior between the male and the female heron. They'll actually share the nesting material back and forth between each other. The, the male will go out and get the nesting material, bring it back, and he'll hand it off to her, and they will, they will work together to, to build the nest. Now, a lot of times, even after the chick is born, you will see uh, nest maintenance, uh, some good housekeeping going on where they, they keep the nest uh, full of sticks and, and keep it strong and they're adjusting things back and forth. So those are the type of shots that you want to look for. Just the birds sitting on the nest, it's really not that exciting. So waiting the situation out and also trying to make sure you have the, just the right angle to capture that behavior when it does happen. The name of the game is being ready. So anticipate what's going to happen. All right, these birds right here in front of us, the, the wind is coming uh, from my back, the same direction that the light's coming here. So I know that the bird is gonna fly up into the wind to land on the nest. So he's gonna come from behind the nest and land. So that's perfect situation right here. So I should be able to get wing spread and a, a face front shot as, uh, as the bird approaches the nest. Even though we are looking up at this nest, having a long lens, it helps compress the shot and it, it doesn't appear in your photograph that you're as low as you really are. Even if you have the white balance set at daylight setting, as it gets later in the day, the, the white balance could get too orange. So a lot of times, late in the afternoon, I will actually intentionally cool that white balance down. So go lower in number like 4900 uh, Kelvin scale and that's going to cool those warm tones down. I don't want to get rid of them because that's the nice thing, that's the magical thing about this light is that it does have nice warm tones but sometimes it gets over exaggerated and just becomes orange. I don't want things that are white to look orange so I like to intentionally tone down some of those warm colors just a little bit so stay on top of that. Getting exposure for the great blue heron is actually pretty easy. Most of this bird is neutral tone. The nest is pretty much neutral tone. And so you can pretty much meter the nest, meter the sky, meter the grass, any of those neutral tone things. And you're, you're exposed, trust what your camera's meter is telling you and you'll be dead on the money. Now we're going, the sun's going down and we're going to go around to the back side of this same nest and try to get a sunset shot. Like I said, you can work or the same subject from many different angles and drastically change the way that your image is going to look. We'll show you how to do sunset shots. So let's go around to the back side of this nest on this other road, shoot back toward the sun. Hopefully we'll have a nice uh, sunset this afternoon. I can show you something pretty spectacular. I think this is going to work. We've moved to the opposite side of this nest now, so we're looking toward the sun. The sun's getting ready to set. We've got a little bit of cloud cover coming in, and that's a good thing. Cloud, uh, thin cloud cover creates color in the sky, and we're starting to get that orange glow. All I want is some nice color in the sky, and I'm trying to underexpose the shot so that I have a nice, solid black silhouette of the nest and the bird sitting on the nest. So. How do I get an exposure for this? All you do is point the camera's meter, which is that round sensor in the middle of your viewfinder, at the brightest part of the sky that does not include the sun. Then I recompose the picture and wait for the action to happen. We do have birds sitting on the nest, the mother's sitting on the nest, and we've got uh, two chicks in the nest, so we might be able to get some behavior there. If you do choose to include the sun in your shot, if you're doing a scenic shot with, where you're including the sun, do not look through the viewfinder of your camera. Use the LCD screen on the back and put your camera in live view mode. That'll protect your eyes. You can seriously damage your eyes by looking through the viewfinder. Think about a magnifying glass. The lens is working just like a magnifying glass. And if you look through the viewfinder, it's a straight shot straight to the sun and you can severely damage your eyes. So live view mode, sunsets. Well, I guess it goes without saying, bird photography here at Vieira Wetlands is truly spectacular. And I invite each and every one of you to come out and enjoy this magical place for yourself. More information about this week's show is available online. And remember, it's not just about the photograph. 
It's the Outdoor Experience. I'm your host, Doug Gardner. Thank you for joining me on another wild photo adventure. He's just sitting on top. I've got a plain blue sky as the background, no clouds to add any any um, compositional appeal there. And the, the trunk is a little bit, ah. The other thing I like about that is, is that there's cows moving in the background. <laughs> there are cows in my background. Okay, we've got a white ibis, beautiful white ibis, and we've got somebody backing up, getting ready to interrupt us again. All right, so as I'm trying to achieve a proper exposure for this specific, waiting on light, just let it, it's in and out, so. Yeah, uh -oh. that, all right, kill it. That one's gonna be here. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heck, they have a much different way of feeding. They are diving. They are diving ducks. Day, day is diving ducks. One little quick tip for you. Not a quick. Not a quick tip. A quick tip. <laughs> um.